The Spring 2016 Applied Ballistics Seminar on this episode of 6-5 Guys. This episode of 6-5 Guys is brought to you by Defiance Machine, defying tradition with innovation. Our Bros Rifles, precision on another level. JC Steel Targets, the industry leader in quality AR-500 steel targets. Hi, and welcome to another episode of 6-5 Guys. I'm Ed Mobley. And I'm Steve Lawrence. Now, Steve, you've been going to, to Dallas for work, and it just so happened that uh, Brian Litz was conducting the Spring 2016 Applied Ballistics uh, Seminar in, in Dallas. So tell the folks a, a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'd found out about this seminar online, and just so happened that they were offering a discount off their normal prices of 500. Uh, I got a hundred dollar discount. So I'm like, you know, if I'm going to be there, I absolutely want to sign up for this. Um, you know, meet Brian, uh, talk with some of the presenters. And when I looked at what you get, it made a lot of sense because you get all of their books. So all the books that they published, which are four of them, uh, and a fifth one, which will be out in July, which is a volume two of modern advancements. You get the DVD set, um, you get the WES software, as well as the seminar information material. All of this at a retail value ends up about the cost of the seminar. So essentially you get the seminar for free if you were to go out and buy this material. So I thought, gosh, what a value. And I um, you know, get to meet a lot of the folks that are out there. Yeah, and so who are some of the folks there in, in the audience uh, that, that we know, that, that we met? There, there are some folks there that were not strangers to us. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, a lot of the folks in the competition world got a chance to, to finally meet, um, uh, you know, Brian Sykes, uh, Kirk Young of the Precision Rifle Media, formerly of Precision, Ri Precision Rifle Podcast, uh, connected with uh, Scott Sigmund of, of Accuracy International. Okay, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, he was there, yeah. okay. Absolutely. So, and you know, a lot of other folks from military and law enforcement world were there. Um, and then, you know, you had industry participants from a lot of big companies that uh, I'm sure you guys may have heard of. Um, got a chance to, to meet um, the head of, um, of uh, the Silent Circle Radius. Um, so uh, that, was, that was pretty interesting. Now that's like a who's who of shooting luminaries. Yeah, in, in it, that, it's a, that, a cross-section of the industry in the precision rifle world. And so when, when I look at this agenda, it's a two-day agenda, and, and we'll, of course, uh, put it up on the website. But it goes from 8 in the morning till 7.30 at night, so it, it seems like they left plenty of time to, to mingle and, and chat they with do. the folks um, over there. There are frequent breaks um, th throughout the event, and then they do a long lunch and a long dinner. Um, Really, for the fact that you know, folks want to kind of get out, search your legs, talk with folks. In the evening, the reason why it goes so long is they have a very long and protracted opportunity to actually sit down as in groups. So you can go out into different breakout groups. Each of the presenters will take a room, and if you want to go mix and mingle and, and ask questions and hang out, that's great. Um, there was that chance to do that in the evenings. That's great. And so you had an opportunity to interview. Brian Litz, uh, where he talks a, a bit about uh, the, the course and, and, and the seminar. And seminar. So, so let's take a look at that video. So Brian, for the folks that are not familiar with Applied Ballistics, which would be surprising, but can you tell us a little bit about how um, Applied Ballistics got started and, and what you guys do? Mm -hmm. Sure, so um, Applied Ballistics is a business I started really to um, publish my first book through. Um, okay. Applied Ballistics for Long Range Shooting is the first book that I wrote. And that book was really the start of the entire company. Um, in that book, there wasn't a whole lot of original information as far as external ballistics goes, but the significance is that, you know, I was able to take a subject matter that's typically written in engineering terms and textbooks and kind of explain it in layman's terms so that average shooters could identify and use the information in their shooting. Um, the original contribution that was in that book is a library of technical data on bullets in which I uh, measured ballistic performance mm -hmm. on a few hundred bullets, you know, using a common method across all brands 
to start to bring uh, some consistency to the world of advertised ballistic coefficients. And this is what most people know as the Lintz Bullet Library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Lintz Bullet Library, you know, started in that first edition with like 120 bullets. It's now at over 530 bullets. And that library exists in print form in the ballistic performance of rifle bullets now, as well as any applied ballistic software that you get, the AB mobile app or the applied ballistics Kestrel, anything that uh, uses the applied ballistic solver, which is a lot of devices now, um, has access to that same library of bullet data. Now you followed up uh, applied ballistics with accuracy and precision for long range shooting. Tell us a little bit about kind of the scope of that book. All right, so accuracy and precision for long range shooting is where I introduced the WES concept to small arms, okay? The WES concept is weapon employment zone. And what that's really doing is it, it's a different aspect of ballistics, all right? Typically we think what ballistics does for us, it gives us a windage and elevation hold to hit our target, right? Well, it does, um, ballistics has more to offer. Um, through the weapon employment zone analysis, what you're getting is a, not just an elevation and windage solution, but also a probability of hit. All right, so if your target is small and far away and you're in a high uncertainty environment, you know, ballistics will provide you a fire solution mm -hmm. for that target, but WES will tell you what your chance of hitting that target is. Is that a 90% shot or is that a, like a 7% shot? So. The WES analysis is used to sort of gauge the quality of a shot, as well as give you a means to analyze your equipment selection, your performance, um, where your training comes in to reduce the environmental uncertainties, things you can do to improve your hit percentage as, as a strategy and a planning tool. And you also have Modern Advancements, mm -hmm. Volume 1. Uh, just finished reading that book, great book. Uh, actually, it was actually the first one I started with. Uh, but I got the whole set now. Tell us a little bit about that book. Okay, so mo the Modern Advancement series, is it's an ongoing, it's kind of like a journal of our R&D mm -hmm. development efforts. So uh, a lot of the stuff that we do in the Applied Ballistics Lab, in addition to just measuring ballistic coefficients, you know, we're exploring uh, the questions that are important to long range shooters, like how does barrel twist affect ballistic performance at long range? Um, how does muzzle velocity affect hit percentage? You know what. And you know, so Modern Advancements One looked a lot at spin rate, um, a lot at ballistic modeling, and uh, Nick Vitalbo, um, a subject matter expert in lasers, uh, had a chapter on laser rangefinder. So we're really just kind of exploring the state of the art in modern ballistics. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's an ongoing series, Volume Two is coming out shortly. And Volume Two focuses. We're starting to get a lot of R&D on hand loading, like advanced hand loading techniques. Um, what to do to drive your standard deviation down, like mm -hmm. to make quality hand loads for long range shooting. Um, that's a big part of that book. Another part of the Modern Advancements Volume 2 is a dispersion analysis. So, you know, group convergence, uh, what type of uh, dispersion characterizes different disciplines of shooting. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, topics that are important to all long range shooters at some level and we're approaching it from a scientific sort of mythbusters approach. That's exactly what I was going to say is um, I like how you set up each chapter. You, you talk about, you know, here's kind of the, the commonly held belief. You show the math behind it and then you actually show the, the research and actually the field testing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I found it uh, very compelling. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the idea. I mean, the, the mythbusters have a good model. You know, they're like, here's what everyone says. Here's what the science says about it. Mm -hmm. Let's shoot some gun, you know, let's see what happens, you know, let's instrument a test and actually yeah. see are the rumors correct, you know, is the commonly held beliefs true? Or, in, you know, in a lot of cases, things that everyone believes, they're conditionally true. Like, yeah, that's true here, but over here, you know, this guy that thinks it's true might not apply to him. So it's really an exploration of all the knowledge that we, that we have kind of culminated over the years in, in this industry to try and take a hard look at it and see what's really important, what really holds. Right. Now, the seminar that we're, we're just wrapping up, um, and, and thank you, by the way, it was just a fantastic time, and I, I learned a lot. Uh, you've, been have, you've been having these for, now, for a while now, they're growing. Tell, for the folks out there that might consider attending one, like, what is it all about? What, what would they get out of it? All right, so the purpose of the seminar is everybody learns in different ways, okay? So, you know, we've published books. Um, that's, that's a good way to get the information. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of people um, don't, don't their learning isn't optimized by reading, okay? Uh, we also have a DVD set, you know, so you can watch it on, on TV and we put out videos and email. Um, but, you know, 
Re in reality, we're humans, right? So we learn best, I think, through interaction most of the time. So, you know, Applied Ballistics, sort of our, our mission is to uh, collect and disseminate information that's useful for long-range shooters. And that dissemination is, you know, the seminar is just another way that we can connect with shooters and pass on what we're learning in the lab. It's pretty much the same material that's in the books and in the DVDs, but, you know, if you've read it and you think you might kind of got it, but you have some questions, that's what the seminars are for, is to come in and, you know, have a discussion. The, the setting, you know, we, we have prepared material that we go through, and it's kind of a formal blocks of instruction, but at least half of the time is set aside for questions. So, you know, guys have a chance to engage the discussion and ask their questions, and it's kind of like, you could say, reading an interactive book, because, you know, on presenting information up until someone has a question, and then it becomes a discussion. So. To, in summary, the seminars are really just presenting our current research in a discussion format because a lot of people find that very effective for learning. Absolutely. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, we had a, a real lively discussion here this evening, um, and I really like that Q&A aspect because, you know, oftentimes you don't realize you have a question until you're in sort of a group discussion and, and right. topics emerge and you're like, oh, yeah, I want to know more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we have the, you know, the formal blocks of instruction like through most of the day until supper time. And then after supper, we have like a really low key informal, just sitting around, you know, talking about ballistics like regular guys, which we're all regular guys, but it's, you know, there's nothing formal about it. So guys who might not really be comfortable raising their hand and asking a question in the formal, they're, they're like, you know, hey, what about this, man? You know, we can drink some beer together and have like some fun discussions about what we all enjoy doing. Um, now, because you know you've interacted with a, a large community of you know precision rifle shooters, folks that are interested in ballistics, um, I'm sure a lot of common questions come up. Are, are there kind of mm -hmm. perennial favorites that come up time and time again? Uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot of a lot of questions about hand loading, um, and you know, the answer to a lot of these questions is you know, regardless of what question, the common question I think of. The answer is almost always, it depends, right? It, mm -hmm. I think a lot of guys expect me to tell them, well, this is exactly what you should do. But in reality, the answer depends a lot. For example, you take something like uh, Meeple uniforming. All right, should I trim the tips of my bullets? Should I point them? How does that affect BC? How, do, how much does it matter? And so because that's a common question, we did a lot of live fire research on that bullets from 22 to 338 caliber to measure all those effects, and so that's published in Modern Advancements. That's the kind of information that's in there. Um, but the, the ultimate answer to that question is, it depends. It depends on what bullet you're shooting, um, how much the BC is gonna increase for a given bullet depends on its shape. How much the uniformity is gonna improve depends on how, un uh, how uh, ununiform the bullets are to begin with. So uh, whenever you're, you know, if you have a question uh, the answer is probably not a straightforward answer. You know, science is like that. It's there's very little that's black and white, and more so a you know it depends. In this condition, here's the answer. In that condition, here's the answer. So, right. it depends is usually the answer you'll get. <laughs> and at the seminar, we have a chance to elaborate on that. Like, what do you mean it depends? Well, here's what all it depends on. A topic of interest to me is. Uh, Long, heavy bullets um, mm -hmm. versus short, fat ones, and, and mm -hmm. you know, gyroscopic stability and, and and all of that. Are you seeing any trends in terms of what you're seeing uh, from a competition standpoint of, of folks kind of grabbing to, gravitating towards the long and heavies? Mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the key considerations if they're going to go that route that they need to keep in mind? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, if you were if you're shooting only out through supersonic range, all right. Mm -hmm. So, to a range that your bullet is above 1,340 feet per second. Um, there's really no reason not to go with that high BC, long, sleek bullet. Okay, that's gonna maximize your performance all the way, extend your supersonic range and have good performance. Now, there is a case if you're shooting like extended range, like really far where the bullet is going to go transonic, there's an argument for a shorter bullet, maybe a lower BC, lighter weight bullet being a better option and the reason is because when a bullet flies through the transonic zone um, its flight behavior becomes somewhat erratic or unpredictable because it depends a lot on stability and a, a long bullet can become marginally stable in transonic flight so it loses its predictability whereas a shorter fatter bullet um, will maintain a higher level of stability and be more predictable now 
the performance won't be as high, but it will be more predictable. And in those extended ranges? At those extended ranges, yeah. So okay. you might encounter transonic speed at a shorter range, but when you do, you can predict the bullet's trajectory through transonic range. And when you're trying to hit targets, you know, performance is important, but predictability is more important. So that's, you know, to answer your question, long, sleek, high BC bullets versus, you know, the alternative, it really depends. If you're all supersonic, go for the long, sleek bullet because stability won't be an issue to predictability. Yep. But if you're going to go to extended ranges, there's a good argument to pick a more stable bullet that's more predictable. Great. Well, Brian, really appreciate again for taking the time mm -hmm. and uh, appreciate being here. You bet. Thank you. All right. Welcome back. That, that was a really interesting interview with Brian. So, so let me ask you this. Of, of all the stuff that was covered in that seminar, what was the one thing for you that was kind of really blew your mind? Was it like a real game changer? Well, I'll tell you. Um, as Brian had mentioned in that interview, Volume 2 has... Uh, I would say almost half of the book is dedicated towards looking at precision hand loading and some of the practices. Namely, uh, the one that kind of blew my mind when he presented this in the seminar was annealing. He presented the findings of what does annealing actually do? And he, he goes through the methodology of how the instrumentation works and all of that. So suffice it to say, I think it was very thorough and, and the data is there to kind of back this up. But what he found that blew my mind of how I think about annealing is you know, may elongate your brass life. I think that certainly is true, but as far as improving the consistency and precision of your ammo, it was not, he was not able to kind of validate that um, with actual results. So does it actually make a difference? Um, I don't believe it does. You know, at least um, the data doesn't support it. Well, I can't wait to see the, the data that alone and is, is worth uh, <laughs> uh, the reason to buy a, a volume two. Again, you, you, you got volume one at the seminar mm -hmm. and volume two will come out in July, right? Yeah. That's, uh, that's going to be interesting to read. It is. Uh, yeah. That, that, that really is. Kind of cause a firestorm on the discussion forums. But again, it's, it's, yeah. it's very data driven, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's why I'm, I'm particularly uh, curious to, to read that. Now, you also had an opportunity to interview Nick uh, Vitalvo. So, I did, yeah. So Nick's of, of Invisti, and um, again, another very interesting interview. Why don't we go ahead and take a look at that? Tell us a little bit about Invisti. Who are we, right? <laughs> so a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks have maybe heard me uh, talk on the Precision Rifle podcast or Precision Rifle Media uh, previously. Um, Invisti is a, a company, we've been in business now for five years. Uh, it's interesting because a lot of us worked for... Lockheed Martin, uh, okay. about five years ago, uh, well, about I'll, I'll go back a little farther than that. Maybe about 10 years ago, there was a program out of DARPA called the One Shot Program, okay. and Lockheed Martin was one of the award winners. Mm -hmm. And uh, my team and I executed the first and second phase of that project. We built a prototype wind measurement system. It's a laser system that propagates a laser from you to the target mm -hmm. and measures the average wind speed between you and that target. That wind calculations is obviously then put into a ballistic solution for uh, shooting at uh, an extreme long range. So that's how uh, we got into this general area. My background's actually in laser beam propagation through the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, kind of a nerdy subject, but that's okay. That's a, that's a fun <laughs> one. Um, we've done a lot of things like optical communications and whatnot too in our past. But about five years ago, uh, we sort of saw that uh, we had reached a point where we really wanted to get products into the end user's hands. And that's where things became very um, interesting for us. We decided to leave Lockheed Martin, uh, start Invisti, okay. and then go out on our own and start to generate products. Now, a lot of what we do isn't necessarily uh, private labeled Invisti. We partner with other companies to produce products. So for instance, uh, the Kestrels, the, the, the Applied Ballistics Kestrels, mm -hmm. we partnered uh, with Applied Ballistics to uh, do all the software integration into those Kestrels. Uh, on the case of like the, the Raptors that mm -hmm. Wilcox produces, yep. uh, we did the electronics and the software design. On all of the Kestrel Link ballistics applications, we did all of that as well. And so um, we've really designed ourselves into a company that does um, electronics and software integration into 
many of the gun or rifle scope manufacturers products. And that's where we sort of found a little niche there where we do a lot of the product development, hand it off to somebody else for production purposes. Very cool. Now, so your expertise obviously is electro-optics, yes. analytics, that sort of thing, ballistics. Mm -hmm. um, in the seminar, yeah. you covered some really interesting research and laser sure. rangefinders. Do you want to give us the highlights? So, yeah. This is going to be coming in volume two of right. advanced uh, or what is it? Modern advancements. Modern advancements. Yeah. Okay. So modern advancements in long range shooting in, in volume one, we talked a lot about just the fundamentals of how laser rangefinders work. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the core components of them? What do you need to be able to do in order to make a measurement? And it kind of boils down to like one single number, what your signal to noise ratio is. And I talked a lot about this at the seminar this week. It's basically how much uh, noise is in the background in the case of a laser rangefinder that has to do with things like solar irradiance and things of that nature. Um, and then how much your signal putting out. So how much laser light and then how much are you collecting? And so we talked a lot about that in the first volume of the book, just the fundamentals of how that all works. But really what was cool is in the second phase or second book that is, uh, we did an extensive laser rangefinder study. We took 22 laser rangefinders and we then uh, put them on a common test platform. Basically mm -hmm. this test, I'll call it a platform, but it's a, we have standard size targets. We have uh, a test range that's been measured out to known distances very accurately. And we then uh, painted targets with known reflectivity of paints. Okay. And we tested each one of the 22 laser rangefinders against each one of these targets. And we did it such that um, we incremented in 100 meter increments and figured out where each of these 22 laser rangefinders sort of fell off, where you can okay. no longer take a range. Yep. And so when you do that, what you can figure out and sort of back out is a performance model for each one of these laser rangefinders. And you can figure out where that signal to noise ratio drops off that you can no longer make a measurement. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's really cool. Um, when you then do that, and you can generate a common performance model for all of these laser range finders, then you can baseline them all on a common platform, a common model, and that ends up being something that's extremely useful for the consumer, because now you can actually understand uh, exactly how uh, each laser range finder performs. Um, against each other on exact same platform. So like one of the big things I have a problem with personally is the fact that like you can't look at a manufacturer specification and then say, okay, uh, I want this one versus that one because they don't compare on a common platform. That's, right. That's what we try to do. We try to take all, all that guesswork. So similar to like just how Brian did the uh, bullets and characterized all bullets using custom drag curves and um, a common model for the G7 and G1 ballistic coefficients, mm -hmm. we did the same thing with laser rangefinders. Yep in the book, which is really neat. Um, and really what you see is that a lot of the manufacturers are, are pretty forthcoming in their specs. Um, but what you'll see is that after baselining them all, it's, it's very interesting to see how they all stack up. And, and some of that information was presented yeah. here in the seminar. And I think it's pretty innovative because you come up with a pretty rigorous testing framework yeah. that can be applied and Pretty universally. Yeah, that's, that's the standard. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're hoping to do. We're yeah. really trying to like educate the consumer and try to make sure that we're putting everything on a common uh, you know, model so that everybody can take their laser range finder out, compare it using the data that's in the book, and say, OK, um, this is my target that I'm usually shooting at, uh, whether it be a deer or an IPSC target or something like that. And here's the performance I can expect to achieve now that I know where this lines up in the book. So it's now pretty One cool. of the things that was covered in the seminar is the importance of data in that ballistics calculation. Yeah. One of the most important is known distance to target. Yes. Right? <laughs> uh, if you don't know that, your probability of a hit is very low. Yes. So obviously the importance of a laser rangefinder is very important, but also the technique for lasing. So for the folks that have laser rangefinders, do you have any tips on how they can improve their ability to accurately range? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, well, it's one of the things we talked about. Of course, wind is a, a huge influence, uh, mm -hmm. but let's just say there is no wind for a minute. Yeah. Not reality, but that's okay. Um, one of the big things is um, when you are, are ranging a target, you need to know your range of target then within plus or minus like one meter. If you don't have that kind of re range resolution, mm -hmm. your probability of hit is just going to drop off. Um, one of the things, though, that uh, I would recommend doing from a laser rangefinder perspective is knowing exactly where your particular, like, not only model, but your particular unit lines up in terms of where that laser spot maps down onto the detector. Mm -hmm. That's a very important quantity to know uh, because at the manufacturer, they do a very good job of aligning it to close to the center of the reticle, I'll say. Yeah. And, and they do that because it's a very difficult thing to do to line it 
dead center on. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'd recommend doing, and, and this is a small, easy test you can do. I'm just going to use a, a target. We're going to say this is like at 100 meters, like maybe a, 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 a target that you would zero your weapon on. Okay. Uh, and make sure there's nothing behind it, for instance. Mm -hmm. And take your laser rangefinder and walk it across the target and continue to try to take a range. And sort of make a mental note on that target then where the return stops so that you no longer get 100 yards or 100 meters. Relative uh, to the radical. Correct. Okay. And at that point, now you know where on the, you know, this side to side direction that mm -hmm. laser reticle is lined up. And then do the same thing, uh, either rotate your, your laser range finder or walk it up and down and do the same exact thing. And what you'll find is you'll find where at exactly on your reticle that the uh, range to target is most accurate. So when you do that kind of thing, now when you go out to say a thousand yards or something like that, you know exactly where to hold. That's going to be that same position that you just found at a hundred and just sort of make a mental note. And that's gonna enable you to get more accurate ranging off the target of interest as opposed to just like the grass in front of it or something like that. Right. Well, Nick, I uh, appreciate you taking the time. It's been <laughs> yeah. fantastic to be here as part of the uh, Anytime. participants in the seminar. Yeah, absolutely, thank Thanks. you. All right, that was an interesting interview because uh, I didn't realize that he'd worked at uh, Lockheed Martin, so I would imagine he probably worked on some stuff that he, he can't even talk about today. <laughs> so, I would imagine, you know, yeah. as he had mentioned, the one-shot program that he did mm -hmm. for DARPA, right, Defense um, Ad Advanced Research um, Agency, they do some high-tech, you know, top-secret stuff. Um, some of those projects are top-secret, so... Uh, I'm sure that's true. In fact, in volume one of Modern Advancements, um, Nick has a, a chapter on there that he wrote um, on that one-shot program. It was a very interesting type of research. And what they were able to do was they were able to use a laser beam and look at particles move within that, that column of light to measure wind speed. And uh, you know, can you imagine if you took that package and that power and shrunk it down and put it on a precision rifle? Well, it, well, and it, who knows what we'll have in five or ten years? Yeah. Because some of the stuff we have today, twenty years ago, was complete science fiction. Yeah, I mean, you you wouldn't you wouldn't believe uh, uh, twenty years ago you wouldn't believe some of the stuff we have now. And and it was interesting because he had made the one comment in the in the video around just laser range finders at wind speed can affect it yeah you, you wouldn't think but i guess yeah i mean it's it's yeah, the a signal uh, to noise ratio yeah it's yeah. A, the signal to noise ratio and and it's interesting too because here in in in, in washington state in the uh the eastern slope of the cascades they really don't understand wind very well mm -hmm. and so they they put up all these lasers that that are going to measure wind and so when i heard about that i'm like man i can't wait <laughs> to, to get my, you know, handheld. Well, you know, yeah. one of the groundbreaking things about what he presented, and this is going to be in volume two that's yeah. coming out in July, is this list of laser range finders. And yes. you know, he gave us a sneak peek of how those 22 range, laser range finders that are currently available on the market, how do they actually stack up? And uh, very, very interesting to kind of you know see where you think you know one range finder you think is going to do really well, well maybe it didn't place so well, and others that um, are not that expensive actually did really well. So um, and it also gave me uh, you know some ideas of if I was to upgrade what I really might want to take a look at. Yeah, I mean there's some stuff that he he shared that I don't think's been released to the general uh, market yet. So I think just for the folks out there, put pay close attention to applied ballistics <laughs> in the area of uh, range finding. Mm -hmm. I think that's safe to say. Yeah. Well, Steve, I really appreciate you uh, coming back and, and sharing what just seems to be a, a terrific seminar uh, with the audience. So this was the spring seminar. How often are they going to be holding these? They hold three to four seminars per year currently. Um, they're trying to make them, you know, obviously bigger, more well attended. Uh, I believe the one in Dallas has probably been the biggest one yet. 120 people, you said? About 120, yeah, 130 good. people, yeah. so very well attended. Um, and they're also, right now, kind of alternating between Dallas and Michigan, trying to keep it within the central part of the U.S. Right. so people can logistically get there easily. Um, although, 
they may contemplate looking at doing something regionally. I, I talked with Doc Beach about maybe doing something in the Northwest because it's a very large community. Uh, of I, I think they here. would be they would be pleasantly surprised how many people yeah. would attend. So no promises here. yet. I know that uh, they're going to perhaps take a look at that. Well, Steve, thanks again, folks. Hopefully, you enjoyed this and found this uh, very interesting, and and maybe uh, you all will be motivated to attend a future seminar. Until then, remember, life's an adventure. Stay on target. <laughs>